on live. There we go. It's on live now. This timing <laughs> thing is different every week. Sometimes it takes forever, and sometimes it's right away. Anyway, hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's show. <laughs> the banter never ends. <laughs> never even ends before we even start. Uh, tonight's show is number 80. It's a big number because, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, and it's been a lot of fun. It's on spring cleaning tonight. We're talking about how to keep your stuff clean, how to get it clean after the big, long winter. We had a long winter. In fact, it didn't even give up. Yesterday, it was white out there. We had another snowfall, and uh, it, was, it was still coming down. But today was beautiful, and it's nice and sunny again, and we're all going to start getting outside pretty soon. Hey, guys? Long winter, eh? What the heck is going on there? You know in the movies where you kill the final bad guy, and he drowns, and then the hero, the hero is, like, kissing the girl, and then the bad guy comes up and grabs their ankle, and then, like, you shoot him one last time? That was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it was yesterday. That was a good one, though. Uh, you know, it's a crazy, crazy winter. We've had a lot of snow. We've had a lot of cold, record ice. Um, I've been shooting still. A lot of folks have been shooting. Everybody in our community has been out shooting still. So what about all our gear? I mean, it's got to be filthy by now, don't you think? Covered in snow anyway. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but, I mean, we, we, we were at a few places where there was a lot more than just snow lying around, and... Uh, <laughs> We had to make sure that when I got home, I was scrubbing the bottom of my camera bag and making sure I got all that stuff off. I've got an old cat around here, you know? Can't have this germ stuff coming in all the time. I was getting so. bubble gum off the bottom of my shoe from the Vaughn Film Festival. Oh, seriously? <laughs> and trying not that? to And trying not to track it all over the place we were putting our camera gear down. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we did a lot of urban exploration this year, a lot of tingly lungs and fun things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, a lot of uh, interesting places. Yeah, yeah, so I figured this time, around now, we got to get our stuff out, clean out our camera bags, see what's in there, get it all clean. And if anybody's watching our show right now and you want to join in the conversation, you have an experience with uh, some mucky muck on your kit that you didn't know how to get off or uh, maybe a good solution to getting something off of a hard-to-get-off place. Like, for example, today I was taking some pictures of... Um, something that's related to our theme, which I won't get into, or our challenge, I should say, for next week. And, you know, it's still kind of all over it a little bit. So how do you clean this stuff off? How do you get everything nice and clean? So we're going to talk about that quite a bit. And I don't know about you guys, but I've actually shot more this winter than I ever have. Like, crazy amount of stuff that, that we've done this year has mm -hmm. just been awesome. So the more you do, the more crap gets on your gear. In fact, I did a session for Henry's a couple weeks ago where I asked everybody to come in and if you spent a certain amount of money, I'd clean your sensor and your camera and so on. And, you know, of course, Darren brought up a few good points about how to make sure that if you're going to clean your sensor, you got to clean the rest of it, too. you got to go backwards. Hey, Darren? Well, just in case anybody didn't make it into your sensor cleaning uh, clinic, in case they went somewhere else, just to know that, you know, it's, it's one thing to clean the sensor out, but if you've got dust inside your lens... As soon as you take another picture and that mirror flaps up and there's a breeze start blowing around in there, that dust, more dust is going to come right back on. So, of course, we had to make sure that if we were cleaning the camera, we looked at the back, we looked everywhere. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. Um, it was a lot of fun. I had a great time doing it. I actually learned quite a bit about cleaning sensors. So we're going to talk about sensor cleaning a little bit tonight as well. Uh, if anybody has questions about that, again... Join the Q&A. Get involved in our show tonight. We have it turned on right now. We've got some viewers watching, so and feel free to a, say hi. What's there's that? There's a new way to clean your sensor that we're going to talk about a little later. It uh, involves chewing gum and just putting chewing gum right on the sensor, and that'll suck all the dust right off. So we're going <laughs> to talk about that a little bit later. Excellent, excellent. Actually, on that note, Gabriel, did you get the, um, the sensor cleaning thing that you ordered? No, I have not. I ordered two for my other studio, and they haven't arrived yet. And uh, I was hoping to, you know, pick up a couple with other people's money, but I might have to <laughs> just order a couple for myself because I know Ron uh, got his and is crazy happy with it. So I can go into that a little bit later. And I think on that note, you really have to be careful what you choose. And, again, since we're going to talk about that later, we'll get into it later. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking yeah. of later, if, you, if you're checking bubble gum onto the sensor, you want to make sure that it's the sugar-free kind, and uh, I think Trident works the best. Okay, okay, good. We, we've got special different flavors and stuff we'll talk about in a second. Um. <laughs> Before that, I have a bit of an announcement. Oh, go ahead. Yes, I, uh, there's a new woman in my life. Ooh. Yes, a new love me. interest. 
Uh, Trish is a little jealous. I kind of been spending a little bit of time with her. Um, not with Trish, with this new love interest. And uh, I got to tell you, it's been pretty magical so far. I mean, I tried making things work with Trish. I walked up and I poked her in the nose and I said, teach me about Premier Pro. And she, she hit me. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but this new love interest, if you have never tried this before, lynda.com. Um, just signed up for uh, some training on it, and it's a yearly subscription, and oh my god. I mean, I knew the training that you could get there from there was incredible, but it is so much more incredible than I ever imagined. They have weekly series. They have, right now, I am about three hours into a eight-hour session on the fundamental basics of Premiere Pro. Um, it, it's been fantastic. So yeah, if you're looking for a little bit of online training, uh, I highly recommend lynda.com. There are so many great places out there to uh, to get some training. Of course, Day Tripper is one of them as well, and uh, Darren has his training as well. And Linda is going to help us help everybody else as well, though. I think. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, that's the great thing about lynda.com is like I I um. I love sitting down for six hours and just you know going over videos, but this is I'm a technical learner. I can um, I, I understand computers, I understand electronics, so I really pick up what they're saying. Uh, the thing that you can't do with Linda is say, hold it, hold on a second. You know that didn't work for me. I don't understand. That's where the how-to hangouts or our classroom training comes in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I've been in this industry. Have we have the minds on the panel that can take this in education and, you know, reword it in a way that makes sense to the people right. who come on our sessions as well. So, yeah. you know, but regurgitation the thing with, of knowledge. Yeah. But the thing with, uh, with Linda is that it teaches things that, you know, we don't. It teaches marketing. It teaches SEO. It teaches, um, it, it teaches like knitting. It teaches like everything. It, it's uh, it's it's incredible. I'm gonna be doing a whole bunch of SEO classes, a bunch of design classes. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna use it much for photography at all because we know a lot of you know the courses we teach them. Mm -hmm. But for like Premiere Pro, which we don't teach, and it's something that I really want to get into more. And Final Cut Pro, oh, I'm I'm gonna really get excited about learning about Final Cut through there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, you know what, ultimately, we used to do Kelby training, and Kelby training is always so much fun. Um, we had a great time doing that, but it's like you say, you know, photography is something that we know quite well, and a lot of the courses that I was watching through that means were inspirational in a way, but they didn't really give me any kind of firm leaps and bounds better knowledge on anything specific, where I'm finding with the Linda, there's stuff that I don't know about that I need to know about, like... I was saying Final Cut Pro, where I'll be uh, doing all the editing of videos for the wrestling and all that kind of stuff. So I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm going to learn a lot of cool tips and tricks from that and hopefully translate that down uh, to some of our sessions in the future at the new academy and so on. Yeah, it's going it's to be great. Cool. All right, well, thank you for bringing that up. Awesome, cool. Darren, what's been going on with you, man? Any big news? Uh, no, no big news. I've been keeping busy and doing stuff. It's... Uh... Funny listening to the news where they say that the heartbleed virus can't be detected the way that people can go on, and then you hear the government say they've identified 900 people that had their social insurance number stolen. Well, if heartbleed can't be identified, how the hell did they find out that 900 people had the social insurance number stolen? It's... So it's technical, but it, it mainly... Basically, it's the window in which they were vulnerable. Um, because they shut down their whole website. So they sort of extrapolated from the window. You can't detect it when somebody pings the server, but as soon as there's an information transfer, then it is it is trackable. So they know they don't know if somebody's pinged the server, but they do know if somebody got any type of information from it. So within that window and the amount of pings that they could track, they know that you know 900 people were vulnerable, which is at the exact moment that our taxes were being e-filed. So we're <laughs> waiting to see if we get a phone call. Interesting. <laughs> some, kid, some kid in London, they, they arrested him today if you weren't watching yeah. the news. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, the heart bleed was bad, but for everybody watching, if you're freaking out, it's nowhere near as bad as it could have been. It's nowhere near as bad as the media is reporting it. Um, security analysts on the first day said out of 1 out of 10, it was an 11. Now they're saying it was about a 4. 
So it's it's really not as bad as um, as we thought it was going to be in the early days. So all you had to do was just don't make any online purchases for a day or two until everything settled out and all of the you know website people got uh, got the patches on and they probably had the patches on before we even heard about it all that yeah they did Google actually uh, became aware of it in March and has been going around it was a Google researcher that found it and has been going around to Microsoft and Yahoo and Apple and um, all the other companies notifying them of it so by the time it went public um, 80 percent of the internet was already patched so I totally had the camera on Darren while you were talking, Gabriel. I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> <I just noticed. laughs> right. it's better to look at than I am. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. And I've been, I've been going through software and hardware upgrades. I was having problems with my motherboard uh, probably from day one. It was just probably a flaky motherboard design and uh, just little things that wouldn't work properly or little things. So I managed to scrounge up. Uh, not a used one, but an open box one. They they don't make it for that process, processor anymore, uh, which gets into a whole bunch of technical stuff, but it meant that I could just take out the old processor and memory and plop it in the new motherboard, and everything seems to be working pretty good. Nice. Little problems I had went away, and then I found out suddenly that uh, I had to reactivate Windows. I had to reactivate Microsoft Office. Whoa, Microsoft Office has already been activated, you know, too many times, so you have to do the call-up. So the call-up one is fine. You just give a hardware number. They tell you some numbers to punch in on the phone, and you're good. Uh, Adobe. This is one of the things that uh, I ran into with some other software. Fortunately, it didn't get uh, dinged in this. It, it worked fine without any reactivation. Uh, but anytime you know you clone a hard drive, or you you know try to transfer a new computer, this is one of the the heartaches. Is trying to get all your software converted over and moved over and switched over, and. Uh, Actually, Adobe, if I would have thought of it, I would have thought it would have been a problem. Adobe gives you the option that you can deactivate your software in one computer before you activate it on another computer. So if you are doing your photo editing, you know, at least on the Adobe Cloud, you can go in, and even though I didn't sign off on the other, hmm. it was the same drive, but just different motherboards. So it saw it as a whole new computer. But it said, oh, by the way, you're trying to use your Adobe product. It's already logged in on other computers. Do you want us to log you off all your other computers? Yeah. That's nice because they didn't used to do that. That's cool. and, then, and then it activated on my laptop again. So it didn't keep track that it hadn't been deactivated. It just said we're deactivating everything. So I'm now up and running on my desktop and laptop. So i got to give Adobe some credit in this. You know, that Adobe Cloud thing is... Uh, actually got some advantages, you know, if you're switching yeah. computers and you forget to do something like that or you're doing a, an upgrade. And that's something that we didn't even think about when we were talking about it when it all first kicked in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Neat. And you're all done? Uh, you're, you're, you're good with all that? It's all cool. working? Everything's up to par? And Yeah, every, every, everything seems to be checking out. Awesome. Okay, I, I'm trying to find a segue to get into the discussion from that. I just, I got Spring cleaning. It's glad oh. that all your cereals are clean now. Yeah. Well, yeah. Your camera could be. <laughs> well, well, I had the computer uh, apart. I took it outside, took the uh, air gun to it, and blew all the dust out of it. I do that about every six months. That's a good idea. And, uh, you know, because the cooling fins and cooling fans, if they get blocked, then everything runs too hot, and then, you know, you can burn out your computer. So, you know, if you've never taken your computer and had it cleaned, uh, maybe you want to pick up a couple of cans of compressed air. I can't find one. It's, you know, they're, they're around somewhere. That's uh, the stuff that you use on the sensor of the camera, right? Uh, well, I mean, you could. <laughs> no. To clean know. out the mirror body or things like that. No, I don't recommend yeah, it. <laughs> I'm crying <laughs> inside. I don't know that I would do that directly on the sensor because it's uh, projecting a, a high stream velocity of air. And it could pit the sensor, and there's contaminants that could come out. And there's propellant inside there that will... Yeah, it could, and, could come yeah, out. I'll probably get into this later, but if you are using compressed air, only ever keep it like this, because the second you go sideways or upside down, it releases the propellant that's inside, which is like minus 65 billion degrees. And it will instantly freeze anything that you're spraying it on. And uh, that's bad. Don't aim it at your face, Gabriel. 
<laughs> I, I have a can. I have a can of the dust off, and I bought some other stuff at Staples that was uh, not for cameras, just you know, regular dust remover. And when that can is empty, I'm going to cut them both open, and I'm going to see if there's any kind of filtering system inside. And I bet you there isn't. So I bet you the more expensive camera grade stuff is the same as the computer grade stuff. Oh, probably. But I mean, um, if you're just if you're just cleaning out the back of your lens or things where the the puffer ball you know, doesn't have enough velocity. Okay, I'm just checking out some of the comments on the uh, can they, can they see community it? here. Um, my mom says she's not able to sign in, which is awful. Um, and Joe LaDuke says he has a computer virus. Oh! So I don't know if he two, does. Two or... Tylenol and some NyQuil. <laughs> <It'll be good. laughs> anyway, I hope my mom is able to sign in. I can't really... Uh, do much to help you right now because I'm trying to talk here. I'm trying to talk over here. So, so uh, let's go watch this. Um, uh, What's that? Say the best the best way to not get a computer virus. Uh, your first line of antivirus is your finger. <laughs> don't click on things if you don't know where they go. But um, oh, come on, Google something. sent me this thing that said, "Open up this. Open up this attachment." Bill Gates wants to give me a hundred dollars. Yeah. Hey, I got an email from somebody in Malaysia dying to tell me that she wants me to give. She wants to give me all kinds of money. I'm supposed to send her something, but I, I, I didn't click it. Am I, am I supposed to? She's emailing you too. Oh. oh, she gets around. But how about some preventative tips for some preventative maintenance for how, keeping camera gear clean? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And where would you like to start with that? Well, uh, we've got a series of tips here. How about I start off with the first one, and then we can just sort of bounce back and forth. I feel like so, bouncing. Go right ahead. All right, let's bounce. Okay, so this is my beautiful 7D. Um, the first tip is uh, when you're changing lenses out in the field, um, always, oh, you, you actually wrote that, and then I wrote the note afterwards. Uh, first of all, always make sure the camera's turned off before you change lenses. Now, why uh, is that? Why well, should you have to turn the camera off? That's a good question, and I'm glad that you asked it. Well, you know, I'm when your to camera you. is on, these digital cameras um, are not like the old film cameras. Mm -hmm. The film cameras, you wanted to keep it down just for particulate. But with the digital cameras, um, when the camera's turned on, it's sending electrical current through your camera, and a lot of that current is focused around the sensor. Electrical currents um, are basically, you know, just think of an electrical current as a sexy girl on the corner of the road going, hey, big boy, want to play? I think of that all the time. <laughs> all the time I think of current, just like that. It just it attracts dust, and that's one reason why um, the inside of computers will be more dusty. Uh, because there's a fan that's sucking air in and then a lot of uh, components on the inside that have an electrical charge and the dust will just stick to them. Think uh, of your uh, your old tube television. Do you remember a tube television, Gabriel? Mm, yes. yes. The tube TVs, whenever you put your hand on there, you get yeah. static yeah, electricity, absolutely. dusty like crazy. Yeah, so that, that dust, uh, when you open up your, your camera, all there is is a lens and a little shutter there and protecting your sensor. And... Um, yeah, it'll just attract dust in there and it'll stick. So right. make sure the camera's off. Darren has something to say about this. I got to be a crotchety guy, and I got to say that maybe in the old days that might have been true, but they put so many anti-static coatings in there that uh, I think the main reason why you want to turn your camera off every time you take the lens off is so that that doesn't happen because the I camera will still the operate. By you could hit the shutter by accident if something you know your finger goes in there. You know why take a chance? So I think, you know, just to err on the side of caution, turn the power off in the camera, and then you won't accidentally do things like that. Yeah, that's a good point, especially good if you're point. on bulb mode or if you're shooting at night the time before and you hit it by accident and it's on a four-second shutter speed or something. So, yeah, that's just make sure. safety there. So, you know, first step one, turn off your camera, then pop out the battery. Put the battery six feet away. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just turn <laughs> off the camera. That's all you it's need like, to do. It's a new one. <laughs> um, just make sure the camera's pointed down um, when you're when you're changing lenses. And a lot of times, like with my rapid strap or with a lot of uh, lens straps, it, it's easier to change the lens that way anyways. Um, what, what I would also recommend, let me just grab the top here. Uh, no, I'm to find a lens. I got one. Gabriel's oh, you always got 100 lenses. 
You always have 100 lenses when you don't need one. Yeah. Um, so basically what I do is I put the lens that I'm going to put on on a, on a surface close by. I loosen the lens cap, but I don't take it off. And this is one tip that uh, I think it was Joe McNally had. He said the best way to make sure that your, your sensor stays clean is when, before you put on a new lens, just take off the cap and, and give a little blow into the, the area in there, either uh, with a, a little blowy thing if you have it. But he says he just opens up goes like that. Make sure you swallow before you do it so you don't end up spitting on it by accident. Mm. And then just pop it on. And uh, he says, I mean, if you know Joe McNally, he shoots everywhere in all sorts of you know situations. And he says he hardly ever has to clean his lens. He attributes it to that. Um, could be other things. But uh, he says that, that seems to work really well for him. No, nope, that's a good tip. Um, you definitely don't want anything getting inside your lens or in around your sensor inside your camera, dust-wise. Uh, well, you mentioned how with your black rapid strap you're able to change it. I love the thing about the cotton carrier system that I use as well is how when, you're, when you have your camera on there, all you have to do is tilt the camera up, change your lens, and then let it go, and it tilts right back down again so you don't have to worry about the dust getting in there. So that's one thing that always helps me out when I'm changing my glass, especially for like when we were shooting the film festival. If I wanted to go from my 85 to the 2470, I literally just had to push down the back of my camera, take the lens off, put it in a pouch, put the other lens back on it, and it kept on flipping right back to neutral every time I let go. Nice. Pretty handy. Yeah. Oh, my camera's on. It's <laughs> depending on where you are. Before you even take the lens off the camera, oh, you guys can't see me because I turned my camera off. Yeah. It's Before awesome. you even take the lens off the camera, maybe you want to take the blower bulb and just blow out around where the two of them meet up because if you left your camera sitting around and some dust and some dirt got in there, as soon as you take the camera off, all the dust is going to go inside. So clean that off. Or... Can I see your, um, your blower thing? If you're going to travel, it's probably better to go with his blower instead of mine because ah. I've actually heard of three photographers now that have had their gear confiscated because of an x-ray machine this looks like a bomb. Are you serious? Oh my god! Um, it's how it was up on Petapixel. So just you know, whenever you're shopping for camera gear, also be thinking about weapons of mass destruction and how dumb the TSA agents are. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you know that ahead of time, now just take this thing out, put it on top of the camera bag when it goes through the check through. And... All this these great have... ideas, lots of nuggets <laughs> flying right now. This, this doesn't have the filter on it. When, anytime I've ever used this to try to blow dust off the sensor, I get rid of one piece of dust and add on three others. It's never gotten right. dust out of the camera. It's just moved so, dust. Whereas this one has the big the HEPA filter. filter. HEPA filter on the bottom. Yeah. Having a filter on the bottom of a blower is a very handy thing. Um, there's so many different ways to clean this. Oh, and it's very yeah, it's very refreshing too. It's funny. I walk around the store blowing the back of my hair. Anyway, that's a whole different thing. All right, we're so far behind. <laughs> I'm gonna save camera bags and empty and clean them regularly. Use UV protecting filter. I'm just gonna blow through them. Uh. <laughs> no, okay, well let's let's get back to this. Okay, so we turn the camera okay. off, flip it upside down, change your lens. And Darren, great point. Use your blower, clean around the lens base and so on. When I was doing the sensor clean, as I took the lens off, of course, I made sure to clean around the edge of this area and, of course, inside this little rim right around here as well because dust can get trapped up inside. Also, another thing that I always try and remember to do when, I, um, when I'm cleaning sensors or whatever is I always do an automatic clean first just mm. to have it I get into. Every camera these days has the built-in sensor clean mode, so first, first thing I do is... It's called turning it on. It's well, if you haven't set that way, ultimately <laughs> I will still go into the menu and do an auto clean. The reason for that is because the first thing I always do when I take the lens off is I use a loop, a lighted LED loop, which I don't have with me right now. Um, Darren, I m might have his Hoodman loop around. No, I've got the lighted LED loop right here. Oh, excellent. Oh, so yeah, that's the um, the sensor clean kit. There you go, perfect. And then the, the, light shine, the light shines down. You look through the top, and you put that right onto the body of the camera here. I can show you right here. Take the lens off the camera. And now you can look right down into the sensor and make sure and see how much dust is in there. And 
this this is a dusty room I'm in, so there's probably like 18 pieces of dust floating in there right now as we speak. Oh no. I'll come clean the sensor for you. It's okay. Where's that can of compressed air? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, hold so, your camera up. And, and the reason I do that is so that um, you can see how bad the built-in self-cleaning actually works. Because every time I do a self-clean and then I look in there, it's just awful. So I think the self-cleaning mode's more spread dirt around than not. So I was more testing everybody out there. They don't work very well. Okay, so you cleaned your sensor. You cleaned around the lens. Make sure you clean inside your lens cap, guys. I don't know if it's obvious, but most lens caps, see that? Dusty. Unless you're like me and just never use lens, lens caps. Unless you're like Gabriel, and then you don't use lens caps. But clean but the, the lens cap. The back lens cap. A lot of people, when they have a lens, they'll take this thing off, they'll throw it in the bottom of their camera bag, where mm -hmm. all the dust is, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll take it and they'll put it back on a lens. Clean your so, caps because that dust is going to get inside your keep lens. The, keep the original cap that came with the camera body. Keep it in your camera bag. If you ever take off one of the lens caps, just put the two of them together. Now they're sealed. Now when you put it in your camera bag, no dust is getting in there. Awesome. Yeah. Yep. Great tip. And if you really want to get careful, then take a lens and then put the back cap on both sides. <laughs> Got a reversing ring. <laughs> it's a reversing ring. Uh, makes the cap stay on easier. Anyway, clean your caps. Front cap, back cap, body cap, all of the above, and that way you won't have to transfer dust back into the lens. So that's preventative maintenance. Good place to start. Now, when you're packing your gear, it's always a good idea to have stuff safely stored in places that are dust-free. Um, my camera bag, when I'm getting stuff in and out of there very quickly, little pieces of salt can get in there in the wintertime because there's salt everywhere, um, at least up here, not down in Florida, of course, Mom. But uh, <laughs> well, different, salt different things on your shoes, there. you put your camera bag down on the floor by the front door. I mean, it's very easy to track debris and stuff around. Exactly. So as Darren did, take it outside. Um, I say take it outside because that's where you took your computer outside. Good idea. <laughs> Um, <laughs> take the bag outside, empty it out completely, take all the inserts out, tap the bottom of it, let all the dust and all the debris come out of there. Uh, even if you want, get a little vacuum, vacuum out the inside of that, use your air compressor in there if you want to. Bottom line is, get all that stuff out of the bottom corners of your bag. Clean that regularly, I would do that, actually. Mm -hmm. Pretty much every time I do something different, I rebuild my camera bag, and each time I rebuild my camera bag, I clean it all out, because it gets dirty. And you need to find a jar of cayenne pepper or some other type of pet repellent to coat the top of your camera bag with. <laughs> when, we were, when we were out at Camp 30, after about the fourth photo, a piece of hair, cat hair, got on my sensor. So one house that I was in, or maybe it was from my cat, I don't know, but cat hair on the sensor. And you know, I've got automatic sensor clean turned on, but you know what automatic sensor clean is, right? Here's a, an old film canister container. Here are some paper clips. We'll pretend this is dust in the compartment. So when the sensor cleaner comes on, it shakes it up. The dust is still in there. So like every fifth or sixth picture, the, the hair would be moved somewhere else and be moved somewhere else. <laughs> so, yeah, foreign stuff can get in there no matter how careful you are. And I'm pedantically paranoid about I always, you know, and do this and change Always doing this, and I still got cat hair on there. So, should I go over the uh, the sensor stick right now quickly? Um, sure. I just want to make one quick little comment. Darren, I saw when he uh, blew into the camera, he was very careful with that. I did have one sensor that I cleaned at the uh, at the event that I was doing, where the person blew into the sensor to try and clean it and spit all over it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was a little harder to clean, but there was. Um... Again, I, it was, I think it was Rick Salmon. He was on a photography cruise, and uh, one of the students asked him to clean, his, to clean her sensor. And apparently the night before, one of the other students had offered to clean her sensor, and he had just been eating chips. And he took off the lens, and he put it in a cleaning mode, and he blew in it, and he just got salt and chips all over the sensor, and it was just a catastrophe. So oh, no. that's why I say swallow first. Make sure you're not eating chips. Common sense, people. And, so, you know, accidents can happen. You know, there's a lot of dust in there, and some people are sensitive to dust. So you take it off. You're about ready to clean it. <laughs> <laughs> it can't happen. It can't happen. Hey, All right, what do you have? Uh, so 
if you notice that you have some sensor dust. Um, and this is the product that I was talking about earlier. Ron uh, just received his and seems to love it. If you have a Canon or a Nikon or a Leica or any one of those cameras and you send it to, you send it to them to clean the sensor, this is the tool that they use. This is the sensor gel stick. And it's, it's what they use in their labs. And for the first time, it's available in North America. It's been available, I think, in Germany for a while, but they just released it in here. It's $49.99, and it's basically just it's a, it's a sticky gel cap. And, and basically, it's got a, a mildly adhesive uh, texture to it. And you just dab it on your sensor and then it comes with this really 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 sticky paper so you dab it on your sensor and then when it when you've got some dust on it then you put it on the sticky paper and it pulls um, the dust off of it and you go back and the only thing you ever have to buy is replacement sticky sheets but they're like three dollars each um, and uh, it, from all the reviews that I've read online from the people that the you know professional photographers I know that have used it and from um, uh, you know, anecdotal friends that I, I know that have it. It's fantastic. It's pretty much risk-free, and uh, you don't have to worry about it. I've just always been, I've never been a person that cleans my own sensor, and uh, once I get this, I'll be cleaning my own sensor for sure. And you know the good thing about that sensor gel stick? Getting back to my uh, paper clips here in the jar, let's say this is the body of the camera. The nice thing about the sensor gel stick is that it's actually taking the stuff out of the camera so that the dust is no longer in the camera, no more dust in the camera, nothing more to get stuck on the sensor. If you don't get the dust out, if you just move it off the sensor, but it's still in the in the body cavity, mm -hmm. eventually it's going to get itself back on because it's going to be attracted to the, um, to the sensor. So getting it yeah. out. Good point. In fact, uh, you also have to be careful which one of those devices you buy. I know that we had... Uh, one of the systems that we had at the store, a customer was using it and found every time he, he touched the sensor with it, it would leave a residue around the end, uh, like around it. So he was cleaning the dust off, but at the same time, leaving this smear oh, on the sensor. Yeah. So, and then, of course, you have to go back in and clean that manually. The manufacturer's website, I looked at it, they did, you know, you know warn you of precautions and, you know, may not be, you know, um, suitable for all cameras, and I think they specified some Sony products, I think Sony NEX cameras, mm -hmm. that they said the coating that Sony puts on there is not compatible, and they are working on a Sony version. Oh, good. Um, okay, and, good. and speaking uh, of the Sony version, there's also the Sony translucent mirror systems, those, uh, the bigger Alpha series Sony cameras, mm -hmm. they have, when you take this off, that is not accessible, like you can't actually lift up the mirror, it's all fixed, so... Um, with those, you can actually just flip. There's a little... Did you just stick your finger in your good camera? Yeah, all the time. So... <laughs> Due to that one, what you did to the Canon camera. No, no, it's okay. It's allowed. You're allowed. That's... I'm allowed. Don't okay. try this at home, kids. I'm like a professional <laughs> wrestler. Do <laughs> not anyway. do what Brian just did to your camera, because there are <laughs> focusing sensors that use that mirror, and if you do anything to jar it out of position... The Sony has a little switch on the bottom. You just release the switch, and it'll pop right up, and you're able to get right back behind it. With this one here, that's okay. Trust me. It's fine. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Brian's next tip. Use UV for protector filters. A good filter won't negatively impact the photo. I disagree. But no filter won't protect from scratches or worse. Now, so, you have disagreed on that point before. In, and in the, the thing is, of, and the thing is let, let's, let's play both cases. My case is I work at Henry's, and I see people coming in all the time with smash filters, and if not a smash filter, a smash lens. All the time. People are as careful as they can be. People have hoods. People have other issues. It still happens all the time. If you're looking to prevent that from happening, a filter is a so, cheaper replacement than anything else. Now, if you have a crappy filter, oh, and for other reasons as well. Um, that looks like a crappy see. filter. This is a very crappy filter that I use for a very specific reason. To show people what not to buy. To show people a big shard that was cut into it by steel wool. Okay. <laughs> All right. There. So, in extreme so, circumstances, yes. 
It's about being smart. It's not about taking any piece of crap and slapping it in front of your lens. It's right. about buying the right product for the right tool. If I have a right lens thing. like this, a 50 millimeter f1.8, I'm not going to sell you a filter for that because of how right. instant it is. It's yeah. filthy right now because I haven't cleaned it, and you know I've been doing some photography of sorts that I, I'll talk about later. So I have to still clean that one. But uh, on a lens which is about 500 to 1,000 dollars and you have the glass right on the surface of the lens right here, it's a very easy thing for that to break. And you know what, Gabe, as much as I yeah, love right. the hoods are what you should have. Yeah, they would have to... As, as much it. as the oh, hoods are something you should have, it takes up so much more space that most of the time I don't even use it, and I know that you're supposed to to get rid of the whatever and the metering, and I talk about it all the time. Right. But to be honest, it doesn't. Ha it's not on there all the time. Right, so, so I, I, yeah, I'm a lens hood junkie. My camera never comes out of my bag without the lens hood on. Um, I have taken, I have personally, I, I, when, okay, so with my photography, I like shooting into the sun. I like putting my subjects in front of the sun. I like silhouetting them. I like f filling them in with flash in the front, having the sun behind them. I like, I like all those kind of effects. And when you're doing stuff like that, having a filter on the front of your camera can and will affect picture quality. You will have so, flare. Yeah. So, um, is a camera filter a good idea? It's the, it, it is the, the age-old photography answer. It depends. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing what I do, no, it's a ter terrible thing. If you're setting your camera up in a tripod and sending off steel wool, it's a fantastic thing. Um, it can affect your picture quality. It, uh, it won't always. Uh, lens hood is a good replacement. It isn't always. Um, you know, maybe buy one for each lens size and, and use at your own discretion. Well, Glenn agrees with you. He says he bought his filters at first, but uh, he hasn't used any in several years. That said, he always uses his lens hood. So right. there you go. Right. And everybody has it's... different things they shoot as well, right? Mm -hmm. So what you should, it's, it's about being smart, using your kit for what it's being made for. Sorry, filters, go ahead. Are, filters are tools. You use a tool for the right reason. Yeah. When you need to, uh, yeah. I was on a boat shooting whales out uh, off the coast of Nova Scotia, and you bet your bottom dollar I had my UV filter on, even though I was shooting into the sun, because I don't want salt water getting into the lens and doing any kind of damage or harm to it. People bumping into a thing, even with the lens hood on, you know, I throw the camera down, somebody throws their keys, you know, just so many things that could happen that could wreck, you know, a really good lens. If I'm doing what Gabriel's doing and taking a portrait of somebody in the sun, then I take off the filter. Yeah. So, Exactly. I, I add that I on as, as protection in cases when I'm going to be in, an ho in a hostile environment. Afghanistan, places like That's that. That's when you use the Kevlar filters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and also remember that the front element um, is usually the cheapest element to get replaced if there is some sort of damage. And the way I look at it, um, it it's oh, usually Gabriel, bad Gabriel, to Gabriel. The, Gabriel. Right. The front element is the cheapest to replace. Unfortunately, it's three hours on the bench to replace the front element, in which case you're still paying three hundred dollars to fix it. So you know what? I just I unscrew yeah. the UV filter, and then uh, I can go out and buy a new one some other day. I can still use the lens; it's in perfect shape. Right. So. Although, if the impact is hard enough to break the lens, a lot of times the lens goes through and, and the filter and scratches the lens on the front. So, mm -hmm. so again, it depends. It, ultimately, it's just like anything. Know your tool, know what works for where you're shooting, mm -hmm. and, and have enough experience behind you to know when you're supposed to use each yeah. of these options. Yeah, I, I have filters. They're always in my bag next to me. I haven't used them in years, but I always have them on me for the time that I feel like I'm going to need it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give a, a little side tip as well. Um, be careful what lens you have on your camera. A lot of lenses have a metal back. Uh, VR lenses like, like Nikon lenses, a lot of them have this little rubber bushing here to prevent moisture and stuff from getting in, which is always kind of handy. But the back is actually metal. A lot of kit lenses that you buy have plastic pieces all around here. Mm -hmm. And if you were to grab your camera like this... Yes, this lens yeah, here is thing. one of the ones that I got out of a bin, and that's exactly what's happened to it. This bayonet mount is snapped off. So this lens does not stay on the camera because someone would grab the camera and pick it up like that. Right. Yeah. At any given point, we have at least one of those lenses in our recycle bin at the store because, you know, you hit something by accident, which is where a hood is handy, but even the hood will transfer energy and break those little plastic pieces. Right. So always be careful how you grab your camera, what lens you have on there, and if it can handle the kind of 
uh, strain of grabbing it by that way. I didn't put that on the notes, so I thought um, I'd add that. Speaking point. of uh, sensor dust, there's a couple of little things to that. The lens, you see how this lens comes out and goes back in? Mm. Back in. Creates a bellows effect, and it will actually suck dust inside the lens. And then, when you're zooming, it can actually be forcing. It's like a bellows; it'll push air into the sensor or pull it away. You know, so sometimes you want to do these creative shots where you're zooming while the shutter is open, and that can potentially be blowing dust in and all around in the camera. So, that's why you should cleaning, only primes. Spring cleaning, <laughs> zoom out. Clean the barrel of the lens. Make sure that there's no dust on here before you put the lens away. And that or other things. Or other things, like potato chips, popcorn, small rooms, <laughs> soap, small rooms. Yes. Yeah. Also, if you are seeing black dots when you are looking through the viewfinder, mm. chances are you have dust somewhere inside the viewing area, not mm. on the image sensor. That is also something that we want to talk about for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of things inside that mechanism that could be dusty. Okay, Gabriel has something up there. That's sort of that's usually the area that gets the dustiest for me. And so I just have a little my rapid strap has a little pocket. I have a little cloth in there. And I just pop that off, clean on the inside, and it usually clears right up. Mm-hmm. Also another place that people find happens all the time is up above here. Mm-hmm. Inside there, dust can get up in there, and when it does that, you're going to see it in the viewfinder, so you'll see little squigglies or little bits up in the viewfinder that's literally through the penaprism and underneath the focusing screen there. So that's another problem that dust, if dust gets up inside there, you're going to notice that here. It won't be on your photo. It won't be like sensor dust where you see it on every single photo in the same place, um, but it'll be up in there. Yeah, you've probably had a dozen people come in the store complaining about it, and they show you and say, look, see, I can see. <laughs> yeah, and people are like, well, I see the dust in my sensor all the time. Well, no, you don't. You see it in the viewfinder. It's a pretty good tell. If you can actually see the dust when you're looking through the viewfinder of your camera, it's not on the sensor. It's on the roof prism or up in there, the focusing screen. Um, waterproof cameras. What do you guys think about that? I think it's a great idea. If you're going to the beach... Uh, grab yourself one of those, you know, compact, waterproof cameras. You don't have to worry about dust, dirt, sand, water getting into it. Uh, you can leave your other more expensive camera, you know, DSLR gear. You want to leave that, you know, away from the beach. Mm -hmm. I think they're fantastic things, other than getting a waterproof housing for your DSLR camera. Do you know what the one, the, the most common reason for waterproof cameras failing is? <laughs> water damage. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. The thing about a waterproof camera that you always have to make sure of is after you've been in salt water, any water, but especially salt water, make sure you rinse, rinse off the camera afterward in fresh water. So get out of the ocean and rinse it off under a, a, a water, some kind of fresh water. And then after you've done um, rinsing it off and making sure that uh, it's all nice and clean and there's no salt around it, when it dries, you open up all the battery doors, you open up all the compartments, you have an old toothbrush or some sort of bristly uh, thing of some kind and clean the seals. Off. Clean all the seals. Get all the little salt crystals and everything that's forming there off of that camera because the next time you close the door, a little crystal will be there. Water Make sure will be Make sure the seals are in good condition. You know, if you're too vigorous with the toothbrush, you could actually brush the seal right away. In fact, a lot of the good waterproof cameras, the Panasonic TS5, the Olympus TG2, they actually come with a little tube of oil that you can keep those seals nice and uh, lubricated. Not gooey, but, you know. Just be, um, be aware, oil attracts sand and grit and stuff, so if you do open it up in the beach to change batteries and there's oil on there, it might not seal up again properly. Right. So, again, be smart with your gear, but that's just something else to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, and, of course, Gabriel's lovely quote, lenses suck, primes rule. <laughs> well, it's just when he was showing the zooming in and out, it all, you know, it sucks in air. Lenses suck. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Mark says something here. Uh, in the Q&A, Mark says, I broke the plastic bayonet mount on my 1855 kit lens. I found a replacement on eBay for $4. It took me an hour to replace it. And the air was blue, but it works great now. Nice. There's just a couple of parts here. You know, this is one that's sort of in, in development. And, you know, a whole, whole bunch of little extra parts that you just got to be careful of, you know, when you're taking it apart. If you're not good with small screws and <laughs> adapters and the extra parts. 
<laughs> Good luck finding those screws now. <laughs> no, the screws are in a little dish somewhere else. I, I don't know where they are, but... What I find to be the most fun to do with those lenses that break is to literally take them all apart and actually just use the glass for elements and how to see things and seeing up close. You can use them like a macro. You can get an old Pringles container, take the elements out of a glass, out of a lens, and put them in a Pringles container and make your own macro lens. I mean, there's so many other things you can do. Set which... ass on fire. <laughs> You're sick. <laughs> if, uh, if you are going to be shooting outside in bad weather, if you know it's going to be raining or snowing or something like that, uh, these little plastic covers are fantastic for camera condoms. Jeeps. Sorry? Yeah, camera condoms. <laughs> camera condoms, yeah. So it's just got a little tie string here, and you just attach it to the furthest point of your, your lens. Dongle. And then I've got the uh, the lens hood here, which gives a little bit of extra protection. You just put your hand in there. It's kind of like when you artificially inseminate a cow. Um, so it should be, I feel very familiar to many. Oh, you've never done that? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, just me. Um, <laughs> this is actually the gloves you use for those go up to here. So this ah, is yes. Um, <laughs> you take the camera and, uh, up there for interior photography. <laughs> <laughs> you can still you've see ever... all the dials, and you can still see your, your back screen. And these are, I know there's one at Henry's called the Hydrophobia, which is uh, pretty expensive, which is supposed to be really, really good. Well, but it's reusable. It's neoprene, and it's you know you can air it out and dry it and you reuse it over and over again. Right. These ones are, are technically disposable, but if you take care of your gear, you can use them again and again. Yeah. Yeah, I've used this one a few times, and it's still in perfect shape. Uh, you get two for nine dollars. Not bad. Yeah, and uh, yeah, there was some guy at the um, zombie walk just giving them away. So yeah, and they got the little elbow in there, so you know, for your arm, and they're great. That's a great idea. Just give them away. Yeah, Mark. Mark said that's exactly why the air was blue. <laughs> he was changing his bayonet mount. <laughs> One thing that you can do is if you've got uh, just about everybody has a point and shoot camera somewhere, set it up on a tripod, put it on the video mode, and video while you're taking the lens apart and do a little test first to make sure that you can see it and you've got good exposure. But video record when you're disassembling it, put these screws here, put these screws here, because you might run into a situation, you know, if you are doing the spring cleaning thing where you don't realize there's a metal ring and there's a plastic ring, and I don't know which one goes in front or behind, right? So something like that happens. Hopefully in the little video that you were doing, you'll see, oh yeah, the plastic one went on first and then the metal one. Cool. Um, we were at the zombie walk where you got that uh, that thing, and yeah. it was very, very cold. Mm -hmm. How do you guys recommend people handle going from cold to hot environments, going indoors? And we've talked about this on other shows, but maybe you can kind of gloss over that for a sec. Maybe Darren. Oh, what's that? Oh. This is the secret weapon. <laughs> Talk to me, Goose. So I always have ten of these in my bag at every time, uh, at all times, and uh, maybe Darren wants to explain why. It's good for putting parts in. It's good for, I mean, put it over the, the camera. You can cut it out. And Ziploc bags are always good to have around just to store stuff. And right. if you have your lens inside it, like you're outside in the cold, everything's very, very cold, exactly. put the camera inside the bag and zip it up, put it in your camera bag, come in the oh, house. Right, 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 right. We're talking Condensation about Condensation won't form yeah. inside. So if you're shooting outside in the winter or even, you know, a cold night in the summer and you go from the cold of outside to the warm of the... And he gone. He gone. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, basically, when you go from the cold outside to the warm inside, everything starts to freeze up, including your computer, and especially talking about it, that's just one. Apparently, yeah. It freezes them right up. Um, and then, when you get back inside, you let everything kind of acclimatize, and then eventually you'll take it out of the bag, and everything will be good. You won't have moisture and stuff all over the place. Yeah, that's it. That was it. Um... Lenses, oh, check the oil blades. A lot of folks don't think about this. When we do trade-ins at Henry's, uh, one of the things we have to look at are the blades inside your lens. A lot of people don't realize, but there are these cool little blades, and when you open and close that opening, those blades will open and close. See that? You can see my upside-down chin. I actually have a lens kicking around somewhere that does have oil on it, and you know why it has oil on it? 
Why does it have oil on it, Darren? Because I was a dough head and I left the lens in my car one time when the car got up to like 900 degrees and it melts whatever oil and lubrication is in the lens. You know, they have grease. Well, when grease gets too hot, it liquefies and it liquefied and it ran onto the aperture blades. There you go. So it can happen. You have to be careful. And if you notice that this is happening, it's going to make your shutter blades stick when it tries to open and close. You're going to have all kinds of issues with that lens from there forward. So don't let that happen. Don't leave it in extreme heat. Excellent tip right there. So don't leave it in your car on a hot, sunny day. Exactly. Treat it like your baby. And uh, we wanted to show people what sensor dust looks like, right? Yes. So uh, I grabbed an image here, and this has got... Uh, more like sensor gravel and dirt. <laughs> it's, oh, it's wow. A picture of blue sky. Any of these black dots that you see, these are all specks of dirt and grime and grit and stuff. So this is an extremely dirty sensor. Mm -hmm. And uh, one way that you can tell is you set the aperture to f22. Uh, if you're doing it at home and it's night, um, you want to up the ISO. Remember to set it back down again when you're done. And you don't care about a long exposure time. So it could be a two-second exposure, a three-second exposure. What I do is I take three photos, and I move the camera. Three photos against, like, a white ceiling, and then I move the camera uh, between each photo, and then I play back the photos, and if I'm seeing the same spec in the same spot in all three photos, then I know I've got sensor dust. If you're not at F22 or F32, chances are you'd never see this. Good, good advice. The way you can check into it uh, with the D7000 that I use at work, or as I call it, the sensor dust maker. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> it, every, it's like, oh, man. But in Lightroom, you can actually create profiles. Um, and uh, whenever you import a picture, it will actually correct a lot of the sensor dust automatically. So that's good. Oh, that is so good. Did you finish the bag thing? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. And, well, and welcome well, back. Pops away now. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, we, we bagged that topic. Um, I was gonna, speaking of bags, I'm kind of a, a bag junkie. I love little gadget bags that I can fill full of stuff. Like, I've got all these little... Here's another one right here. And then I got this guy over here. Lots, lots of bags. This, this one here, this is for the walkie-talkies, so when we're doing a day trip, we can all communicate to each other. All kinds of cool stuff in there, yeah? This one here, this is all the GoPro stuff. Lots of GoPro accessories and GoPro video. And then over here, I've got all my flashlights for day trips. All the little gizmos and cleaning and hot hands and rubber cement. Got to have all that. So my point is, when you have all these little bags, you got to keep them clean as well. I mean, there's stuff going in and out all the time. I'm always trying to pay attention to, you know, make sure I go home with everything that I left with. So Or more. Or more. <laughs> that would be cool. You know, it's an expensive hobby. Go on a day trip, you know, feel free to go home with an extra Sigma lens. <laughs> and, um, what's that? Yeah, a drone bag. A drone bag, yes. Don't worry, there will be drones in the future. Um, another really important bag is your battery bag, the bag that you keep all your batteries and so on in. So one of the things you want to do when you're getting yourself all together and cleaning up all your accessories for the, for the season is make sure your batteries are fully charged and... Most importantly, we're not left right there. Last thing you want to do is leave your batteries in your flash. In mm -hmm. your flash, have you guys ever had this happen to you, where you had all the batteries leak inside there and go not, get corroded? Not in my flash, but in other devices. Yep. Mm. In every single one of Jaden's toys. <laughs> Written off, <laughs> thrown away, not even Stop. working. My, my SOP, standard operating procedure, is anything that I don't use batteries in on a regular basis, the batteries are always stored outside. The, the only exception is when you've got remote controls. Here's a remote control that right now I'm in the middle of working on. I've got to resolder the antenna on, but there's a battery inside. User replaceable if you wanted to. You can go to you know Radio Shack and pick up another battery. Uh, but these ones aren't easy to take out. Right? I'm not going to take this thing apart. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for a reason just to take out the battery, but what I will do is once a year, whether you want to do it in the spring or fall is up to you, you know, as part of your spring cleaning, is you change this battery, and that way when you're out in the field, it's not dead. Yeah. You know, so maybe change it twice a year, you know, what's it going to hurt you? A couple of dollars to ensure that you've got a good battery, because if something presses on the button, 
and it keeps the uh, you know it keeps that little light on while it's in your camera bag. You know that's going to drain your uh, drain your battery. So maybe you want to change them twice a year, and that way you know that uh, you know every spring and every fall you know you got a new battery in the remote control, and it's going to always work. Good tip. And you actually had that happen while we were out. And no, Blake, that is not where your glasses went. Your prescription would be way too <laughs> off for me. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> All right, cool. So that was a lot of stuff we've talked about. Um, I think we've pretty much covered everything on our list. If anybody has any other things that you want to talk about to maintain your cleaning kit or things that you, you've had issues with in the past that you want to bring up, we're still going to go on for a few minutes about the challenge, the photo challenge this week, which was very light. Did you guys notice? Yeah. Uh, I, I thought it was a very homey photo challenge, not a very light photo challenge. But <laughs> it was very homey. It was actually amazing photos, but a few mm-hmm. less than normal, which tells me one thing. It tells me that the weather's nicer and people are actually out there making photos okay, instead of at home on the computer posting them, which is just Shame fine. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame. Ah, I think that's great. Um, <laughs> you know, I post I posted a photo was it this morning or yesterday morning about uh, you know normally the first snowfall everyone's out there posting all these pictures of fresh snow <laughs> and that nice snowfall we had nobody posted a single photo. No, everybody's over it. I didn't even <laughs> grab the camera. I was thinking about it, but I didn't do it. I um, don't even think there are hand gestures. Coming out. Yeah, really. His, his will just be like a lighter to a snowflake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he posted earlier, here's another snowflake. Even I am tired of the snow. <laughs> you know it's bad when. Um, so why don't we start going over here? I'm going to do a screen share this time. Uh-huh. And, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, no, 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 I'm take away your toy. No, I was saying that's awesome. Oh, okay, cool. Up up. You know what? i gotta got to live on the edge. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here you go. So here is the starting stuff. So Gabriel, go ahead, take it away. All right. So, um, are we just going over? Are we going over all the images, or just well, the, the you final know what? collections? We didn't have too too many, so we're gonna breeze over most of it and talk about the ones that we uh, that we picked. Okay. All right. Why don't we talk so, about the photo that fooled Gabriel first? Yes. Okay. Good idea. So I'll pull it up here fooled me first was this one and um, I, I just I just sorry I looked it on my phone first I thought it was totally awesome what I thought it was is I thought it was a uh, rat or some type of rodent in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles running through a sewer grate great and uh, so it was like street photography they were out you know shooting and just happened to catch this this awesome shot um, and then it was pointed out to me that it was a barbecue, uh, <laughs> so um, that would be you know replacing my barbecue after that. <laughs> <laughs> it's I, so cool. It's good well, timing. It's really neat. It, it's not a shot that is easy to get. It's not a shot that you see a lot. Um, but uh, it, it was my my clear pick for first place when I thought it was uh, a sewer a sewer grate. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. As soon as I saw it, I thought, oh, my God, I, this happened to me last year when I opened up my barbecue. Oh, really? I pulled it out of the shed, I opened it up, and it was a big wad. Do you of not mouse barbecue nest. in the winter? Well, I, I love to barbecue in the winter, but I have, my good barbecue has been broken, so I've been using a little cheapy one, oh, and I don't okay. want it to get destroyed. So Okay, because we still barbecue like once a week. All. I'll, I'll be out there wearing a motorbike helmet and a skid skidoo outfit. Uh, when we get a new one, we'll... All the time. I'm all I'm all for that. I love that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. I, I gave up after there was eight feet of snow and the barbecue mm-hmm. just got too buried and I didn't want to shovel the whole deck to get to it, so I said, no. <laughs> all you have to do is turn it on. It'll melt all the snow around it. <laughs> yeah, not, that, not this <laughs> one. Good luck. In, instant barbecue right there. Dinner all in one. Speaking right, of barbecue. barbecue. <laughs> yeah, speaking of barbecue, oh, this is pretty sad. <laughs> now we're making barbecue jokes about a church burning down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Luckily, nobody was hurt. But, uh, no, nobody was hurt but this 100-year-old church. Yeah, you know, that is the most insignificant to me. I, I My cousin used to live right behind there. Um, that that block, that block there with the home hardware, sorry, the pro hardware now and stuff, I mean, that was my stomping ground. And we never... 
we never acknowledged that church. There's another church across the road, uh, not a church, but it's got like the um, the bell tower mm -hmm. and stuff. We used to always sneak in there when we were kids and you know make out and stuff. But uh, yeah, we never. That's the one church I never had any interactions with in any way. And in all honesty, I hardly ever even noticed it was there. So when I looked it up on Google Maps, I'm like. There's no church there, but <laughs> <laughs> well, there won't be strange. soon, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, they're going to be right. building, aren't they? I hope so. So here's the next two photos. Uh, Joe found another instrument to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I only say that because last time he said that uh, he, you know, he was running out of instruments that he could take pictures of. Guitars, <laughs> drums, and now it's a, it's a clarinet yeah. or a flute or clarinet. I played the clarinet for a while, actually. It always smelled good. Yes. That's a whole different, okay. whole different thing. I don't know. Uh, so <laughs> that was a great shot. Thank you, Joe, for uh, sharing that with us. Um, green, green, grass of home. That's how it relates to the home challenge. And beside that is a photo I took with my cell phone. I didn't have a lot of opportunity to make my home photo this week. So while I was outside, um, my wife brought our cat out. And, of course, everybody knows Angel is 21 years old now. And, you know, every time she makes it to another spring or another summer, we're always happy that we can take her back outside and walk around. But she's old, so put her in a blanket and take her out there. So there's Shelly, my wife, with uh, with our cat. And of course, we were having our barbecue, and there was no mice in there or anything like that. That was good. So, or a cat later on? Yeah, no, no cat. <laughs> it's like, why do you have the barbecue out and you have me wrapped in a blanket? <laughs> <laughs> wow, take it there. <laughs> All right, well, we have Lori's photo here. Darren, what do you think of this? Well, I think this is annoying Lori, and she really likes her um, her poetry, Home is Where the Heart Is. So when, when I saw this photo, I knew exactly what she would be uh, coming up with. Yeah. It's, I love the lighting. I love the shadow. Mm -hmm. Nice clarity in the eyes. Of course, focus on the eyes is very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she and, nailed it. Focus on the eyes. Great lighting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I know that she wanted to take more pictures of her son. There was a, a post of a blog of some photographer somewhere in Europe, I think, that had you know, like hundreds of photos of their kid as he was growing up. And Lori says, oh, I really wanted to be able to do that. I think, I think she's getting some really good shots of him now, so... She is. She's doing really well. It's excellent seeing what she uh, what she's putting out these days. Okay, well, next always. week I'm doing the screen share because I keep grabbing your sidebar. <laughs> See, that's why it. I'm doing it because I kept on trying to do that to you too. Okay, so here's Mark's first photo. I like that one. Yeah, I, I love it because of the story behind it, right? Yeah. And Darren, you made a good point about this. Yeah, the speedometer reading is zero. What a what a what a chicken should have been like 140, 160. <laughs> Day Tripper Photo is not responsible for Darren Gahan's opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in park, so right, you know that he safely took this photo showing that uh, he needs to go home yeah. some other way if he doesn't get gas soon. <laughs> and he's in eco mode, which is good too. And there's Mark's other shot. Oh, I'm hungry. That is... <clears throat> That is home. That is that is where my that is where my wife gives her sighs of happiness when we're cuddled up on the couch. We're in our pajamas. I'm in my onesie that I got for Christmas, and we got a big bowl of popcorn, and we're all just cuddling up watching a movie. I agree. I agree. The cat's in the shot, cleaning itself. Everybody's nice and comfortable. Even the yeah. fish are nice and comfortable. And and it's a nice lighting. It's not you know harsh lighting. It's natural lighting. You can see the reflection of the TV off his shoe. Oh, I thought it was a glow-in-the-dark shoe. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe. Mark yeah. is creative. <laughs> All right, so there's that. Sean posted this shot here of a pigeon. and It's the story that's interesting about this shot. Uh, pigeon racing requires a specific breed of pigeon bred for the sport. The Racing Homer. I've been known to be called Racing Homer. It's kind of interesting. Um, competing pigeons are specifically trained and conditioned for races that vary in distance from uh, for approximately uh, 100 to 1,000 kilometers. Wow. Despite these lakes, they can be won and lost in seconds. So, hmm. interesting story. A well, homing pigeon. And you weren't a homing racer. They didn't call you that, Brian. They called you a racist homie. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. Darren, Darren. The views expressed on this pod show are not necessarily the opinions of Daytripper Photo or its affiliates. 
That's two disclaimers in five minutes. All right, next one. Home Alone. Home Alone. Home Alone. <laughs> Isabelle's. <laughs> Now, there's two folks Very in our cute. community, at least two, that have these types of dogs. And, of course, we, we initially, when we first see the photo, we think, oh, there's bacon again. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, this isn't bacon. This is Isabelle's. Awesome, awesome photo. This is one of my favorite shots of the week. Um, I love just the mood on these dogs' face, just the clarity and the, the expressions that you get out of the bulldog. It's just so fascinating. <laughs> Why are you trying to blame this on me, woman? I didn't do this. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's pointing at a cat. Yeah. Yes, I'm on the ceiling. Yeah. The cat's on the ceiling. He did it. <laughs> Fred posted this shot here. Uh, New Market's founder, homely dining room from the 1850s with permission from Elman Campbell Museum. I thought this was another one of Fred's house. <laughs> He's got so many cool things. You know, last week I said that the photo must have been from the museum, and then I get an email right after the show, no, this was in my house. I'm like, all right, well, this must be your house then. <laughs> no, it's the museum. No, it's the museum. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it looks nice. It looks like my grandmother's place. There you go. Nothing? Okay. Chris's photo here. I wonder where this was shot. Yeah. I'm thinking St. Joseph's. Or St. Jacob's. What is it? St. Joseph's? Nice. St. Jacob's. St. Jacob's. Jacob's. It's moody. Feels mm -hmm. like it's early in the morning. Um, looks, you know, they got their horse in park. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What'd you say, Darren? Looks um, foggy or misty. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's like a white vignette on the top or if it's actually like maybe some gradienting on the top or if it's actually a little you know, layer of fog coming in. I know somebody was yeah. talking yesterday about selling a parking space in downtown Toronto for $30,000 a month. And I'm thinking, yeah, you know, like 200 years ago, you're going to tell somebody they're going to charge them to park their horse. <laughs> wow. <laughs> $30,000 yeah, 30, to park your horse and carriage, please. No, thanks. I'll sell the horse. Uh, Here's Rod's photo. Darren, you like this one. Yeah, it's uh, an old home, old log home. You know, I love all the old abandoned places that are around, and, of course, I've been known to stop in on many of them and have a look around. Um, this looks like an interesting old place. The top window's busted out, fallen right in. Yeah, and there's no hydro uh, to it, so it uh, looks like someone did live in there and modernized it and then they cut it off. I wonder, I wonder where that is. I think I know the place. If it's the place I'm thinking of, they used to have a little house like that and then they had two of those big satellite dishes, you know, back a few years ago when satellite dishes were really popular. Mm -hmm. thinking they got no money for a house, but they got enough money for two satellite dishes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny you say that. When I lived in Vermont, um, there was a strip of, of road that we drive by every morning, and the houses were literally built out of cardboard and plastic, and yet they had their their satellite dish. And this was like 1985, 86. I mean, the satellite dish must have cost them more than their house did. It was crazy. We call them the condom minimums. <laughs> nice. But uh, yeah, I digress. Okay, <laughs> so we have a couple of cool shots here from Julie. Um, on the right, I guess that would be everyone's left, is I moved to Newmarket almost five years ago. The people in our neighborhood and the community around us immediate, me, immediately made it feel like home. I agree. I love Newmarket. The minute I moved to Newmarket, I fell in love with the town. Um, it has country. It has city. I just absolutely love the people. I've had no problems. I love it. I don't know. Too many flying drones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> out of control <laughs> flying out drones. Control. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yeah, that's a conversation for another show. <laughs> and, of course, the dugout for the home team. Well, do we know it's the home team or maybe it's the visitors' team? Well, she said the home team. Well, but maybe the home team has got the cushy cushions. Are you calling Julia a liar? They're just not out there yet. <laughs> it's the home team. I'm, I'm just saying what she says, yo. Yes. <laughs> I'm just... Oh, Chris said that the, uh, the, the photo she posted was in Elora. Elora. Yeah, that sounds right. Right around. It was fog. Days. It wasn't a vignette. It was fog. Oh, cool. Beautiful. All right. Well, there's the photos. That's all of them this week, guys. And it's just as well because we could have oh. kept talking all day. Squirrel. Mm -hmm. Before we go there, Joe says that uh, he did a photo shoot and somebody had a really dirty sensor. 
they did a model shoot on white backgrounds. So, Joe, one of the cool things about Lightroom is you can fix the sensor dust, and as long as no model is going to be in that part of the photo, you can uh, automatically batch process that batch process that to all your images. Yeah, that's a super handy feature in Lightroom. And it, like you say, as long as there's nobody in the shot, because if there is, they'll have little spots all over their faces. And... Yeah, it could get funky. Yeah, it could get funky. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if it fixes 60% of them for you quickly with, you know, like an automated one-click thing, and then, you know, the other ones, you just go in and undo it. Yeah, just tweak the ones that you need to. Okay, so let's pick our top two photos of the week. We can only pick two. And the winner is... Mark's photo. <laughs> there you go. Mark's photo. This is our, our. This is the photo that all three of us looked at and said, "Yes, that's home." Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys agree? It's our happy place. Yeah. It's our happy place. So thank you for yeah. sharing your happy place, Mark. Maybe you're just yeah. hungry for popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And second place this week goes to. Chris's photo. In Alora. Nice. Beautiful shot. And of course the other two the third place, the honorable mention, we split down the middle. One goes to Julie for the dugout for the home team. Mm -hmm. And one goes to Isabel for Home Alone. Wasn't me, it was the cat. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Great stuff this week, guys, and thank you so much for taking the time and posting your photos of the week for our challenge. Mm -hmm. The challenge you, this guys. yeah, thank you. Excellent stuff. We absolutely love nothing makes me happier than sitting at home and having somebody post day trip or photo challenge. Yes. Makes me happy. Yes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Your pleasure. You keep it up. Doing awesome stuff. I'm talking like I'm a school teacher now. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Squirrel. Okay, so uh... <laughs> so this week Brian is going to post the photo challenge topic in the photo challenge photo area, right? Yes, I will. And we're going to try and find a new way to post the topic so that everybody can see it, kind of so it sticks at the top of the page all the time, so everybody can see it right away. Yeah, all right. Be able to figure that out because that would be cool if we could do that. Yeah, that would be really cool. So I'm going to do a quick screen share to show the photo challenge for this coming week because this is what I was shooting today and this is the challenge theme. Bubbles! <gasps> bubbles! Hey, do whatever you want. There's lots of different things you can do shooting bubbles. I was having some fun just uh, Mike K was talking about uh, how do we make bubbles look glow-in-the-dark? And, of course, I start thinking, oh, well, I had flash and gels and da 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 Well, what I didn't realize was he wanted them to actually glow in the dark. So I'm not a chemist. I couldn't really help him out with that. But it made me wonder, what if I could take some pictures of bubbles there, and a, make them look kind of funky? There's a place I know that you can get glow-in-the-dark bubbles. Uh, you'd have to travel to Japan and go to Fukushima. <laughs> yeah. Oh, glow, God. Glow in the dark there. That is not cool. Uh, too soon, too soon. Anyway... That's the theme this week is bubbles. So go out there and make some bubble photos, everybody, and have a good time doing it. And remember to keep your stuff clean because this lens hood is covered in soap. And I used a filter on the front of my lens so I wouldn't get soap in my lens and so on and so forth. So, yeah, there's bubbles bursting all over the place, getting a lens very close, a macro of some kind. I want to uh, see bacon bubbles. <laughs> bacon bubbles. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I can just see Chris's mind going right now. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for watching us this week. And if you're not watching live and you're watching afterward on YouTube, please click like at the bottom. We'd love it if you liked us. And uh, maybe you can share the shows. Maybe you can subscribe to our channel. Keep involved in what we have going on. Join the Day Trip Photo community on Google+. And don't forget the Algonquin Day Trip is coming up on April 27th. It's very soon. Uh, about under two weeks away. And there's still about three spots on the bus remaining. So if anybody is interested in signing up for that, please go to www.daytripperphoto.com, which is right here in case you don't remember what I just said. And um, register. Get on there. Oh, and Gabriel, thank you so much for all the time that you've spent on the website lately. It looks fantastic. You've updated it. It looks beautiful. 
I appreciate all your help with it, so uh, thank you so much for that. My pleasure. And Darren, thank you as always for all your input and advice on the upcoming sessions. We will have our list of sessions very, very soon on the Day Tripper Photo community at the new academy space that we have. We have two or three really cool sessions that we're going to launch shortly, and we're just going to work out the dates and get that stuff rolling. All right, anything else to add, guys? I'm cool. I'm waiting for bubbles. I'm waiting for bubbles. <laughs> Where can people get a hold of you, Darren, if they need to hire you for your services? Uh, on my screen, Darren at dgvirtualtours.com. I've been doing a fair number of uh, Lightroom training, private training sessions. So if you get stuck in some computer software, uh, you're looking for some help in getting yourself organized, you're getting yourself on track, I can definitely help you out with that. Darren at dgvirtualtours.com. And Gabriel, where can folks get a hold of you? Well, they can get a hold of me at uh, Gabriel at bousquetphotography.ca or just bousquetphotography.ca and click on the contact page. And, uh, yeah, my wife and I run a, a wonderful photography company where we shoot weddings and special events and profile pictures and corporate headshots and birthday parties and you name it, we shoot it. If it involves a camera, we can get it. And so, for some yeah. weird reason, I don't know how you do it, but you always find time to add more. It's like you're a time gen genius. Time <laughs> well, I'd sacrifice um, sleep for everything, pretty much. <laughs> I, I, last night I was happy because I actually got a full five and a half hours. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> five and a half hours. My brain wouldn't even turn on. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for everything you guys do. And before we leave, we're going to leave everybody with a quote from a, a, a person that inspired me years ago. Um for those of you who watch wrestling, you all know I shoot professional wrestling um, up in Barrie and a few other places, and there's this one big moment that happened recently. Is The Ultimate Warrior passed away last week, and it was a big shock. He was just on Raw. Uh, he was on the big event, uh, WrestleMania, and then the day after on Raw, and then the next night he passed away by a massive heart attack. Um, so Ultimate Warrior, this is a quote from you. Uh, you must show no mercy nor have any belief whatsoever in how others judge you. For your greatness will silence them all. And I agree with that. Keep up all the good work everybody's doing on our photo challenges. Don't worry about what anybody else says or does about what they do. And just keep up the good work and be you because you're awesome. And that's it. All right, guys. Thank you both so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And if there are no more questions from anybody, we are going to stop the broadcast. All right. That's it. I never know how to say goodbye, so I'll just do it like this. See ya. See you next week. <laughs>